Hello! In this lecture, we're going to talk about how you will create the collage for your assignment 4.1. There are two ways to do this, and they're both perfectly fine. The first way would be to simply do it with scissors and glue out of um, using magazine photographs, any kind of found photograph. I'm going to ask that you not use drawings, paintings, anything that was created uh, by hand by someone, because remember, your collage is a step on the way to assignment 4.2, where you're going to render it yourself in Illustrator. Many of the drawings that you'll find on the web were created in Illustrator to start with. If you redraw someone else's drawing, I don't think that's fair use. But we're going to say for this assignment that if you use a photograph, you're going to be changing it enough in the redrawing process that it is fair use. So any found photograph will work for me, even if in its original form it happens to be copyrighted. The magazine collage is much easier to do technically, of course, but you may find that it's much more difficult to find photographs that have exactly the value structure that you need. I certainly found that when I was working to develop a magazine collage as a sample for this assignment. I'm going to show you the Vermeer that I started with. We'll be showing you in just a minute how to grayscale this and reproportion it. But this is the original painting, and of course what there is is a fairly dark passage here, a kind of big uh, solid area that moves from dark to light, a figure brightly highlit with chiaroscuro from the left, and a dark rectangle behind that figure with a passage, a sort of a gradient from light to dark on this wall. So let's look and see how I did that with the magazine photo. I looked for, um, I found a window here, a little bit of a gradient, although it doesn't really go in the direction that I would have liked. I wanted to carry that window further down, a um, little darker on the left, a little brighter at the top here. I couldn't find curtains that were as long as I wanted, so I pieced some together from photographs, thinking that in a rendering I could obviously sort of smooth that out and fudge it a bit. The um, table with the dark tapestry um, and the complicated objects on top. I sort of changed that into this dark guitar. I found a figure carrying a light guitar and figured that that would sort of substitute for the light objects on top of the table. I found some kind of a tapestry to hang on the wall, a dark tapestry to go behind this figure. I decided to put in two figures, both lit from the left. Now, this is not a very close um, duplication of the value structure, but it's definitely inspired by the value structure of the, of the Vermeer. And I think if you get this close doing a magazine collage, you're uh, definitely learning from the Baroque painters and uh, profiting from their interest in integrating positive and negative space using value. So that will be the difficulty. Um, I started, I believe, on a black sheet of paper here. In fact, I'm not sure exactly where it might show through, down here at the bottom a bit, perhaps. But if you have a lot of very, very dark shapes in your negative area, you may find it easier to work on black paper rather than white. It's perfectly fine to do that. Let's look now at the uh, digital collage that I created in Photoshop. This one, although of course it takes some Photoshop technique, is uh, probably a more accurate rendering of the value structure of the Vermeer. So for example, I was able to get that gradient that I wanted simply by laying in a gradient over this uh, sky that I had chosen to replace the negative shape of the wall here. The um, gorilla that I chose to replace the um, lady weighing jewelry, I was able to reverse the position of the gorilla. His, the light on this gorilla was actually falling from the right in my original photo, and I simply flipped him. And I was able to shrink him or expand him, I can't remember now, to exactly the right size that I wanted, and so forth. I think I, I mentioned in a previous lecture that these white panels on the stove don't quite fit into the value structure. But remember, we're not trying to exactly duplicate the value structure. 
we're trying to use it to inspire a new composition. So again, if you get this close to the value structure of your original Baroque painting, I will be very happy and will be feeling that you've learned from the Baroque masters and that you're working on integrating positive and negative shape. So the things that we're going to look for are a full value range, chiaroscuro, in other words, highlights, bright highlights being picked out from darker figures. We're going to look for places where figures start to melt into each other because the values are very similar. So here where the negative shape is quite dark and melts into the obelisk or into the stove or where the stove uh, is very similar in value to the skirt or the gorilla to the dark door behind him him or her, I'm not sure. So that's the sort of thing that I'd like you to get from your Baroque painting. Let's look now at the painting itself, whether you're choosing the magazine collage or whether you're choosing the digital collage. I would like you to know how to grayscale this painting because I think it will be a good guide to you. You might even want to print one out if you're doing the magazine collage and collage your elements on right over the painting, very similarly to the way I'm about to show you to do it in Photoshop. The um, painting can't show. You must find a photograph for every space in the painting. The painting itself cannot show. And so another way to do this, of course, would be to just work on a black sheet of paper and keep the painting next to you on your desk so that you can sort of check sizes and make sure you're getting more or less the right structure. Let's look now at how we're going to alter this painting in Photoshop. And the first thing I want to do is go through a few differences between Photoshop and Illustrator. We've already addressed this a little bit when we were talking about the pen and pencil tool. Photoshop, of course, is a bitmap program. And so that means that unlike Illustrator, your files have both a size and a resolution. And I'm going to find out what the size and resolution of this painting is by going to image, image size. Click that and a window will open up. My resolution for this painting is 72 pixels per inch and the height and width are quite large, 14 by 16 inches and some change. The, um, I just want to, uh, well, okay that for just a moment, we're going to go back to it in a second here. I just want to point out that there will be a little number at the bottom of your screen here when you open the painting that you've chosen. And Illustrator is telling you here how much of the information it has about this painting that it's showing you. It's only showing me 50% of what it knows. In other words, there's some resolution and size that's wasted on my computer screen right now. I can see the painting in its full detail. If I hit Command Plus, or if you're on a Windows, it'll be Control Plus. I'm going to zoom in, and you'll notice that the percentage has changed. Now Illustrator is showing me two-thirds of what it knows. I'm going to hit it one more time. Now it's showing me 100%. This is the full resolution. I'm going to scroll across here. At this resolution, I'm actually seeing the cracks in the canvas that, or panel that Vermeer painted on, which is kind of neat. You get that real feeling of the physicality of the painting, and you really can see the beautiful detail and the uh, fall of light on the forms and the fabric here. Lovely. If we were to scroll in further, or, or zoom in further, excuse me, Command plus plus, I'll go into 300% uh, here, and now you can probably see, even in the screenshot, that the pixels are starting to appear. And you can certainly do this with the painting that you have chosen. Command plus plus in and you will see that it finally loses resolution if you look too closely. Let's minus back out, control minus or command minus, depending on what kind of computer you're working on. And now we're going to change the image size and the image mode. So let's go to image here. All these things will be done under the image menu. First we're going to change the size. We're going to change it to 300 dpi. And this is sort of an artificial thing to do. We're not really adding information to this picture. We're adding 
resolution so that when it's printed out, more of the information will be printed. 72 dpi is the typical resolution for an image that you find on the web, although if you searched for this image using the uh, large size tool, you may ha have gotten lucky and found one that is much larger than this, th or that has more resolution than 72 dpi. 300 resolution is a great resolution for printing, easy number to remember, so um, I'm going to change it to that. Now I don't need the image to be nearly this big. What I need it to be is 8.5 by 11. That's not quite the proportion in which Vermeer painted it, but I'm going to do a little violence to Vermeer here. Sorry, Vermeer. I'm going to click the lock that constrains the proportions between width and height, and I'm simply going to type in the height that I want, 11 inches, and the width that I want, 8.5 inches. And you'll see the uh, proportions changing here, often in a very funny way as you do that. Now I'm going to click OK and watch what happens on the screen. Remember, I've added resolution, but I've subtracted size. Those are the two things that work together to, um, to give your file a particular size or weight. Now Illustrator is showing me half of the information that it has, but suddenly the picture is much bigger, right? That's because I've rather artificially added resolution. In other words, Illustrator is just repeating some pixels because I've insisted that I want 300 per inch instead of simply 72 per inch. But it has some extra pixels to throw in there because I, took, I cut down the size. So you want to find a picture on the web that is... Um, as high in resolution or as big in size as possible. Both of those things contribute to a large file and a nice, highly resolved print. Zoom out here and you'll notice that the lady looks like she's gone on a bit of a diet. Um, she's a little bit taller and thinner than she was. That's okay because that's what we want. We're going to work in the 8.5 by 11 format and then we're going to finally create our um, Illustrator rendering in an A3 format, which is only a tiny bit different, very, very close in proportion to 8.5 by 11. You may be asking yourself why I care about the size of these things <laughs> since you're submitting a digital file to me. For one thing, I may wish to print these out, as many of you have agreed to allow your work to be used, for example, in the student show, and in that case, I would need to print it out. You may wish to come into the lab and print these out yourself. They will be um, very, very beautiful images if you put the um, energy and creativity into them that I know you want to. And you may wish to print these out for portfolio pieces. So it's good to have them sized to the correct paper that you'll want. And the other thing, of course, is that I simply want you to learn to have control over your image size in Photoshop. So we're now going to change this to grayscale so that you can see the value structure a little bit better. Right now we may be a little bit distracted by the colors in this painting, but I'm going to go Image, Mode, Grayscale. And at this point Photoshop will ask me, do you really want to do this? Discard all the color information? And I'm going to say, yeah, I do. And there we go. The um, painting has now been reproportioned. It's now grayscaled, and it is ready for you to either print out if you wish to make a magazine collage, which will also be 8.5 by 11, a very convenient size, I think, or it's ready to layer on found images that you will get off the web, and in that case you would be making a collage digitally, very much like this one. If you are making the magazine collage, you are welcome to turn this video off right now and stop here. <laughs> you will be scanning or photographing it and simply uploading your collage as a JPEG according to the assignment instructions. If you wish, um, and I really encourage you to do this, 
why don't you watch the rest of the video and find out a little bit about how you'd use Photoshop. You may wish to try this. There is kind of a learning curve and I'm pretty much offering this to you as an option just because I want you to get your money's worth out of this class and uh, have a chance to try some of these Photoshop techniques. So you could even do a combination of this. If you couldn't find an image that you wanted in a magazine, but you were able to find it online, using Photoshop you could resize it, play with its values, flip it around if necessary, and then print it out and put it in your magazine collage as part of the magazine collage. So you could do a sort of a hybrid of the two. So from here on out, the instructions will be how to create a digital collage in Photoshop. Just want to make it very, very clear that this is simply an option and that it is possible to get full credit for Assignment 4.1 doing it as a physical magazine collage. Okay, let's look at how we'll create this digital collage. I'm going to start with a different Vermeer painting just to change things up a bit and also to uh, walk you one more time through the process of grayscaling and reformatting your painting. If you're playing along with me here, simply open your painting, which you will have found using a large size uh, search tool. You'll go to image, image size. The first thing that we're going to do is um, click the little lock between width and height because we're going to be reproportioning this painting. It has a pretty high resolution already, but I'm just going to change it to 300 for consistency because that's an easy figure to remember for a nice high resolution printout, which is our goal eventually for this collage. We're going to make its height 11 inches, so we're adding resolution but very artificially. We can't really add information to the file and we're going to make the width eight and a half so that again this file will will uh, be um, attenuated a little bit, kind of drawn out. Just like with my uh, lady weighing jewelry, we're going to see that this guy looks like he's gone on a diet a little bit. I'm zooming out a bit so that we can see the whole thing. Now Photoshop tells me it's only showing me 16 or 17 percent of what it knows, although some of what it thinks it knows is some artificially added resolution. I'm now going to grayscale this file by going to Image, Mode, Grayscale. And one advantage of doing this is that any information that I put into this file now will go in as grayscale, and we'll see what that means in just a moment. I've now downloaded into my um, computer a bunch of images that I found online to save time so that you won't have to watch me search for things. Um, you'll notice that everything I've found is a photograph rather than a drawing, and I have opened these through Photoshop. So when I open an image in Photoshop, it opens in another tab. And here are some things that I've chosen thinking that I might be able to use them as part of my Vermeer inspired collage that I'm going to be creating. So I looked for a critter that had light falling from the left to replace my geographer and I chose this image of a big black dog. This is, it looks to me like this is actually not quite a grayscale image. I see a little bit of color here and here, but I'm not going to worry about that right now. Everything that goes into my grayscale file will go in in grayscale. So I'm going to choose this dog here, although this guy's adorable. I don't really need him for my collage. I need a figure that's lit from the left, and I like the looks of this big black dog. So my problem now, of course, is to select the dog, because I don't want all this background, and I don't want this cute little chihuahua or whatever it is. So selection is a much bigger deal in Photoshop than it is in Illustrator, because remember, in Photoshop images, we have to select the actual pixels that we want and delete the ones that we don't want. Whereas in Illustrator, we tend to select things object by object or path by path simply with a click. This dog is not an object. 
I have to somehow isolate its pixels from the background pixels. There are several tools that will do that for me rather quickly if I have a fairly simple background, and that's why I picked this dog, because <laughs> his background is fairly simple. So first of all, we're going to look at the Quick Selection tool and the Magic Wand tool that are underneath it. The Quick Selection tool is a way to select an object that is fairly distinct from its background. And I'm just going to show you a couple parameters of the tool here. First of all, we have a brush size, and I can change the brush size by rolling up and down on this uh, little scale here. We'll take this brush size of 12 pixels just at random. The other thing I'd like you to notice is that there are three modes. The New Selection mode, the Add to Selection mode, and the Subtract from Selection mode, which is, seems to be chosen right now. And just to save time, I'm going to use the Add to Selection mode. I could start with a New Selection mode and then choose the Add to Selection. So um, I'm going to start by clicking on the dog. And you'll notice that if I simply click without dragging, um, the Quick Selection tool rather rapidly adds to my selection. I'm going to Command Plus to uh, get in here, to zoom in here and see a little bit uh, more accurately what I'm doing. And I'm pretty sure that if I click here on this, uh, on this dog, I'll start to get some of these background pixels now. So I'm going to Control Z that and make my brush size a little bit smaller here, down to three pixels, so that I can grab a little bit more of this highlight area, which I actually really do want. Remember that I'm looking for a figure that's highlit from the left without getting the background as well. I think while I've got this um, very small brush, I'm going to try clicking and dragging. Clicking and dragging makes you select things a lot faster but it's easy with the um, quick selection tool to get a little bit more than you want. I'm very, very cautiously selecting this uh, highlight on the ear here. And you'll see now that I've pretty much got what I want on the ear. I'm going to go, the rest of this looks a lot easier to select to me because it's much more distinct from the background. So I'm going to go back now and increase the size of my brush so that I can work a little faster. Whoa, that's nice and big. And I'm simply clicking now, just clicking without dragging, trying very cautiously not to get my brush out here into the background as I click. Now you see I've got an area here that's a little bit less distinct from the background. Let's try clicking here and seeing if we can get it. There we go, I've pretty much got that area now. I'm gonna zoom out a little bit so that you can see my whole dog. And you'll see what we call the marching ants, showing us that it's selected. And we're going to add to that now. This looks so easy to me that I'm going to take a chance and click and drag. Click and drag is a way to select very quickly with the quick selection tool. You'll see that it was even smart enough to leave out that little negative shape. Got my whole tail and everything. I'm going to click and drag a little bit more here. And whoa, look at that. I've got the whole dog. Now that I've got the dog, I can copy it and paste it into my target file. We'll hit Command C in order to copy it. We could also go Edit, Copy Pixels. There it is. And now we're going to paste it into our target file. One thing I'd like to do before we leave this file, though, is just take a look at its size. This was downloaded from the web, and it's very likely to be, yeah, a 72 DPI or uh, 72 pixels per inch file. So although it's nice and big, its resolution is less than a third of the file we're putting it into. So it's probably going to go in there looking really small. Let's take a look and see what happens when we hit Command V and paste it in. Oh, there's our dog, but not very big. We want this dog to replace the figure of the geographer. We're going to have to make him quite a bit larger for that. Fortunately, we can do that. We could have made the original file larger, either by increasing its resolution or by increasing its size, but either of those two things would not have added information to the file. In other words, the dog will probably be a little bit pixelated and low res when we enlarge him. 
sometimes it's easier just to do it in your target file because then you know exactly how big you want to make him. So we're going to look at how we select the dog in the context of the target file. Now if we had to go back and do what we just did, that would be a real pain in the neck. If, uh, if every image that we put into this file goes in in the same layer and we had to go around and tediously select it in order to edit it, transform it, um, we'd, we'd be in a pickle. So uh, Photoshop kindly, by default, puts each image in, in a new layer. If you don't have this Layers window open in your window, please go to Window and click Layers just to make sure that you can see what I'm seeing here. The background layer should be a picture of whatever your grayscale Baroque painting is, and the layer right on top of it should be uh, it should have a little picture of a dog or a golf ball or whatever you are just putting into your file. Now that I have that layer activated, and you can see it's it's activated by default because I just opened it with by putting the dog in there. It opened itself, really. If it weren't activated, I could activate it like this by clicking on it with my cursor. This is the one I want to activate now, layer one, because I want to select that dog. But just activating the layer is not enough to select a region because you might not want the whole dog or you might have two dogs in that layer. So what we're going to do now is go up and just click on this move tool here which um, is a very useful tool not only because you can use it to move things but because you can use it to open this little auto select checkbox. Under auto select you can have either group or layer auto selected. Please choose layer and that means that when you activate a layer, it will automatically be selected. Everything in it will be selected. And you can click this little box asking it to show the transform controls automatically. If that box were not clicked, you could get the transform controls for this dog by going up to Edit, Transform, and either choosing Free Transform, which as you see brings us the transform controls, or choosing a specific transformation like um, distort or warp or skew or rotate. What we want right now is scale and we can get that under free transform. So the, we can also get it by having the checkbox checked. The um, transform controls here should look very familiar to you from Illustrator. These work the same way. You can distort something's proportions by clicking on it. I'm going to Command Z that or Control Z it. Uh, you can change its scale by dragging this way. I'm going to again Command Z that. You can change its scale but keep its proportions by holding down the Shift key. And that's what I'm going to do because I want this dog to be approximately the size of this geographer here. I can always change my mind about the size but something like that. And now, in order to move it, I'm going to go back and get that Move tool, and I'm going to get a message from Photoshop. Apply the transformation, and I'll say, yeah, because I do like that scale change that I made. Now I can move it. That's an important thing about Photoshop. Selecting something and transforming it are a much bigger deal in Photoshop than they are in Illustrator. <laughs> Uh, it's a little, it takes a little bit more skill to learn how to do it. And um, when you're in the middle of a transformation, Photoshop will not allow you to do anything else until you accept that transformation. You can accept it by clicking on another tool, like the Move tool is my go-to tool for this sort of thing, and getting that little message. Or you can accept it simply by hitting the Return key, and that will accept a transformation. Now let's take a peek at that uh, philosopher, or I guess he's a geographer, under here. I can move my dog out of the way to see him, but this is obviously inconvenient. Another thing that I can do if I want to see him is I can take the visibility off of the dog's layer. The dog is still there, but with the layer window open, I can uh, either toggle on or off the visibility of the layer. While I've got this layer activated and of course auto-selected, I can also 
adjust the image itself. And this may be very, very handy if you're not getting the chiaroscuro or the darkness or the lightness that you want in a certain image. My um, go-to adjustment for this project, and I trust you'll use it uh, a lot yourself, is brightness and contrast. But you can explore a whole bunch of other ways to adjust an image here. Brightness and contrast allows you to turn down the brightness of the dog, turn it up if you're not seeing all the detail you want, or you can leave the, uh, the exposure, I guess you could call it alone, and you can adjust the contrast. If you want a little more chiaroscuro, you can um, bring up the, um, or, or bring down the contrast of the dog. So one thing that you might try if you want more chiaroscuro is really brighten the dog like this and then increase the contrast so that you darken the darks, right? That would make the chiaroscuro a little bit more dramatic, probably more dramatic than we need. Click OK on that. Let's take the visibility off the dog to see if it matches the geographer. And no, I, I kind of juiced it up a little too much, didn't I? So another thing that you can do if you've just made an adjustment like that is that you can fade it. So you can go to Edit, Fade, Brightness, Contrast, and you can turn it down just a little bit, right, so that you can get it back to a um, um, something that looks a little bit more like our philosopher, but a little bit snappier than the dog looked originally. We'll click OK. Now I mentioned that if you I'm going to show the transform controls here. I mentioned that if you find an image but it's lit from the wrong side, because lighting is going to be really important in this, one of the uh, simple things that you can do here, of course, is flip the image, which you could do in Illustrator. If you remember, I'm going to Command-Z that because I also distorted it a bit. Uh, when you have your layer activated and the um, select active layer checkbox clicked, you can also go to Edit, Transform, Flip, Horizontal, or Vertical, and you can get uh, specific rotations here. So those are uh, simple transformations that you can do. Anyway, I like my dog pretty well, and I want my dog to have a chair to sit in. And somewhere here I found a picture of a chair that I think will work. I'm going to accept the transformation that I've got here by clicking Return. And then I'm going to go to ah, hodgepodge armchair. Now this will be a very, very simple thing to select. And that's one reason why I chose it. I want to show you another selection tool here. You could, of course, use your quick selection tool. But in a case like this, the magic wand tool will often do the job for you with one or two very, very quick clicks. The magic wand tool selects similar pixels. And just like our uh, quick selection tool, there are several modes it can operate in. It can operate in the new selection mode, the add to selection mode. You can subtract from the selection that you've already made, or you can take its cross section with another selection. And uh, we're going to use the add to selection mode right now because this will give you a new selection and, add you, and allow you to add to it. A couple of other important things about the Magic Wand tool are its tolerance and whether or not you click the Contiguous button. I'm going to approach this selection by selecting the background and then inverting the selection. So I'm going to select everything that's white or pale gray. I'm going to click the Contiguous button because when I go to select white, I might select some of this stuff in here which I don't want. I only want the background. So I'm going to, um, and I could add, um, more tolerance, but instead I think because this looks like it's probably about one click's worth of stuff, I'm going to click that stuff first, and then I'm in the Add to Selection mode, of course, so I can go ahead and grab anything that I missed here, and as, you, as I mentioned, you can see that I am looking to select the background this time, and with a big simple background and the Magic Wand tool, it is easy with a few clicks kind of like green screening in a movie. Very, very easy to select that background because it's different in color from the image. And then we're going to remove it by inverting the selection. We're going to go Select, Inverse, 
And you'll notice now that instead of the marching ants surrounding my whole frame, they're simply surrounding this chair that I want. Again, we'll just take a quick look at the image size here. Bet you anything, it's 72. Oh, no, it's not. It's 96, but still a very small resolution compared to our target file. Fortunately, a fairly large image, but this is still going to go in a bit small. So Command C or, or Control C, depending on what kind of computer you're using, or Edit Copy to copy these pixels. Now that I have them on the clipboard, I'll go to my target file, which is Johannes Vermeer. There we go. And Command V or Edit Paste to put it in. I'm going to go to my Move tool now because I want to move this thing. I want it to replace the chair that the geographer is sitting in. I want my dog to sit in it. How are we going to make that happen? <laughs> well, first of all, we're going to reverse the chair because it's going the wrong way. So I could either simply flip it like that and kind of eyeball the proportions, or let's Command Z that. I could go Edit, Transform, Flip, horizontal, and then I'll get the exact same proportions that I started with. Now I want the chair to be quite a bit bigger, of course, so I'm going to scale it by dragging on the transform control and holding down the shift key. Remember that if you don't see these transform controls, first make sure that your layer is activated. There's the chair layer. You can see the little teeny chair there. And then if you hold your move tool down, which I'm not going to select right now, you, you'll get that checkbox to make sure that you can select that you have selected the active layer. Then you can go to Edit, uh, Transform, and that will give you transform controls. Or you can choose that little checkbox that says Show Transform Controls. Okay, so now I've got my chair about the size I want. It's a little hard to tell if it's exactly right, but if I choose the Move tool now, I'm gonna it's going to ask me do you want to apply this transformation? So I have to tell it that I want to apply the transformation before I can do anything else. Now I've got my move tool selected and I should be able to move that chair down. I think I want it just a little bit bigger. I want the back of it right about where the back of the geographer's chair is, but I want my dog to be able to sit in it. So let's see if I can get it just a little bit bigger. I might have to run it off the file here. I'm going to shift and drag on this thing. And I'd also like the um, values to be a little bit more uh, high contrast, right? To kind of match the dog. The chair looks a little bit grayed out compared to the dog. So I'm going to accept the transformation. And then I'm going to go Image, Adjustments, Brightness, Contrast, and turn up the contrast on the chair. This turns down the darkest darks, brightens the brightest whites, and just gives me a little bit more contrast. Click OK. Now you can see one problem I have, though, is that the dog is still behind the chair, and I want the dog to be in the chair. So I'm going to simply grab the dog's layer and pull it up above the chair layer in my layer window. And when I do that, the dog is in front of the chair. The dog seems to be levitating a bit, so let's move this chair up. I'm going to uh, activate the chair layer, and I've got my move tool selected. That allows me to monkey with the chair a bit. I think I'll move the dog, too. And I'm going to bring the dog down a little bit like this. Now the arm of the chair is on the same layer as the rest of the chair, and therefore the whole chair, of course, is behind the dog. If I want to bring the arm of the chair in front of the dog, I can do that pretty readily. I'm going to uh, go back to the chair layer. I'm going to take the visibility off the dog layer so that it's not in my way. And I'm simply going to make a copy of this part of the chair, which I can paste on over the dog. Now, this whole chair layer is currently selected, correct? Let's zoom in a little bit so that we can now select just the arm of the chair. For this, I'm going to use a different selection tool. The quick selection tool might work, but it's a little bit iffy because these values are also similar. Same with the, uh, with 
the magic wand tool. That's not going to work very well. Let's try the lasso tool, which allows us to draw the marching ants around the region that we want to select. But remember, right now the whole chair is selected. What we want to do is cut it down to just this part. So we are going to ask it for the intersection with the current selection. And I'm simply going to click and drag my marque around here. I am doing this with a mouse pad. And I'm not perfectly happy with my selection here. So um, I got a pretty good uh, rough idea of what I want to select, probably good enough for my purposes. And what I'm going to do now is simply Command C, or I can go Edit, Copy. I'm going to put my dog uh, back in so he's visible. And then I'm going to go Command V to paste the pixels that I copied back in. Let's move out and see what happened. Okay, we've zoomed out, and it's not immediately obvious where these pixels are, but there's a very easy way to find them. We're going to eliminate the chair. We're going to eliminate the dog. And we've still got, there it is, our little chair arm. Let's put the chair arm up above the dog. I need to make my um, layers window bigger. Let's get rid of the brush presets. There we go. We're going to move this layer up above the dog, and then we'll put the dog and the chair back in. I'm going to get rid of these transform controls. I'm going to uncheck the little checkbox so that we can see what's going on. And now the dog is sitting happily in the chair. He looks a little big for the chair. Very, very easy to fix that, though. Remember, activate the layer and go to Edit Transform. In order to see the transform controls, we can go Edit Transform Scale, or you can check the See Transform Control buttons. I'm going to make my dog just a little bit smaller so that he seems to sit a little bit more comfortably in the chair. There we go. Now, let's take a look at what we've got here. I'm going to accept the transformation by hitting Return, and I've now got a dog in a chair instead of a geographer in his chair. The dog is dark against the light negative shape. Now this isn't my light negative shape. I'm going to have to provide my own light negative shape in there, and maybe that's a good thing to do next. Let's take a some, something that we can use for a background, and I found a picture of some curtains. I don't want the whole curtains, but they're fairly light, and I could, in this case, simply drag a selection marque around a chunk of these curtains that I think will work for me. So say I take a chunk maybe about like this of these curtains. I don't particularly want this stuff at the top, although I could always change my mind about that. I've dragged a marque. All I have to do is hit Command C or Edit Copy, and then I can go back to my Vermeer file and paste it in. Command paste. Look at those tiny curtains. Let's see how they look when we make them bigger. I'm going to move them up to the top here, show transform controls, and drag those curtains open. Whoa, they have gotten so pixelated. There's so little information in those curtains, and yet that might be all I need to draw over with my pen tool, a vague idea of curtains. It's a fairly simple wall, right? So I'm going to go ahead and take those curtains. I'm going to drag them down so that they are uh, past the little bottom of my dog here, and so that they um, go all the way over to where I'm going to have another wall start, about like that. Obviously, I have to accept that transformation before I can do anything else. I'm hitting Return. And, oh, suddenly my curtains get a little bit more high res. Now I'm going to move my curtains behind the dog and the chair, because obviously I don't want them in front of the dog and the chair. They're obscuring an awful lot of my painting, which gets to be a pain in the neck, but I can see it simply by taking the visibility off. So I can see, do I seem to have 
the kind of value system here that the wall is providing. And I'm thinking my curtains are a little bit bright. I wish they were darker, particularly on this side. This side isn't so bad, but this side is really too bright. There's another way of selecting things in Photoshop that allows you to paint your selection on. You can even paint it on using a gradient, and that's what I'd like to do here. I've got this whole area selected right now because the auto select layer box is checked. And I don't really want to do that. I want to just select part of this layer now. So I'm going to unclick that little checkbox. And I think we'll unclick show transform controls too because we don't need those right now getting in our way. In order to paint my selection on in a gradient, I need a button which is hidden way down at the bottom here. I can't even get to it on my screen. So I'm going to change my toolbar by clicking these two little tiny carrots up here at the top so that my toolbar is doubled up and I can see the tool that I want, which is the quick mask mode button. If you don't see this down at the, it will be at the very, very bottom of your toolbar. If you don't see this, try clicking those little carrots to shorten your toolbar up. When I edit in quick mask, I paint my selection on. And I'm going to paint this selection on in a gradient. I'm going to use the gradient tool. When I paint my gradient on, I've got black and white chosen here, which is the normal default setting. I'm going to click on one side and then click on the other. And you'll notice that an orangey pink sort of gradient is painted on the layer that I had activated, layer four. And you can even see that orangey pink in the layers window here. And what is happening here is that uh, a selection mask is going on. The orangey pink is a mask that prevents that part of the layer from being selected. So what I've really done is I've taken this image here, which is all that's in layer four, and I've said I want this part selected, but I don't want this part on the right, and I want a smooth gradient of selection. In order to do anything with that selection, I have to get out of quick mask mode and back into marching ants. Look what happens. When I get out of quick mask mode, the marching ants can't show a gradient. And there are some pretty funny and surprising ways that the marching ants attempt to show that you've put a gradient of selection on that layer. But what's going to happen here is that the part that I've selected, the left-hand part, is progressively going to get unselected as, as it goes to the right under where that pink mask was. Now I'm going to use image adjustments, brightness contrast, just as I did on my other two images. I'm going to turn the brightness way down. And you'll notice that instead of the whole image getting dark, the left side is getting darker faster than the right side. Let's OK that and then do it one more time. because I'd really like that left side to be pretty dark. Is that dark enough? Let's see. I'm going to OK this, and then I'm going to take the visibility off of layer 4 and see if, it, if I kind of recognize the values underneath. And yeah, let, let, uh, this area should go almost to black on this side and be sort of a middle to light gray on this side. And I'm pretty happy with that. I might darken it maybe just a little bit more. On the left, I'll do one more adjustment here. But I think I'm getting now into the ballpark of what I want. And as you see, although this layer is getting very dark almost to black, this layer is still retaining, or this side of the layer is still retaining a lot of light. When I'm happy with this, I'm going to deselect by hitting Command D. The quick mask selection method is often used when selections are so complicated. For example, you're trying to select a very brightly colored image out of a very brightly colored background. It's sometimes easier to paint the selection on than it is to do it any other way. Let's see what more we can do here. Um, I, would, uh, I, would, I would like to show you how to select a few more things. So we're going to look for an image that we can replace 
that um, bookshelf with back here. And I think I have a refrigerator or something that I found that I thought would work. Let's see. Ah, there it is. Yes. Okay. Now this obviously would be very quick to select with the um, magic wand tool. We could select the whole background with one click and then invert the selection. No need to do anything else on this one, although we could also probably just drag a selection marque, a rectangle around it. It's so close to being a rectangle and we don't need this detail at the bottom here that we could get away with that very, very easily for these purposes. We'll probably get a little white rim around the edge and sometimes it's handy to trim that off by going select, modify, contract. And it'll ask us how much we want to contract. Let's just say by one pixel and watch that line. Then as I hit OK, the line jumps in just a tiny bit to the edge so that any sort of half gray pixels that might brighten that edge are taken out. It's a very fine point, but in, uh, in more um, elaborate uh, selection work, you will use that a lot. We're going to hit Command C, go back to our target file, Command V, and again, our refrigerator is much too small, so you know what to do here. You're going to activate the layer that has the refrigerator in it, and it went in conveniently in front of the curtain layer, the layer that we just messed with, and behind the chair and the dog, which is good. That's where we want it. We could easily move it, though. I'm going to activate that layer. Uh, we're going to uh, use the Move tool to make sure that Auto Select Layer is turned on because we turned it off before. And we can either show the transform controls or go to Edit Scale. And then I'm going to hold the Shift key down so that the lovely proportions of this fridge are not lost, but I may choose to lose them, of course, anyway. And uh, I'm going to drag that thing into position. And then we're going to take the visibility off of both it and the, whoops, we're going to hit return to accept the transformation and then take the visibility off so that we can see that, oh yeah, I've got it a little too big, right? So we are again going to um, just, uh, yeah, just peek underneath here and get it, get it about down to size. Once more, of course, let's accept the transformation. Once more, we're going to have to alter the value. Another great time to put a gradient in, and I'll go over that uh, quick mask mode again one more time with you. Let's put all of our layers back on so that we have an idea of how dark we want to get here. Um, going to make sure that quick mask mode, first of all, is selected and that the proper layer is activated, and you'll see it turn pink. And then we're going to uh, decide which uh, which uh, side of this fridge you want to darken. And of course, again, we're going to darken the left side and leave the, the right side bright. So we see that the correct layer is activated. We're ready to use quick mask mode. We want to darken this side. And so this is the side that we do not want to mask. The uh, quick mask uh, mode, the the orangey pinky sort of paint that you're that you're putting on the mask that you're painting on corresponds to the black color here uh, so we're gonna uh, choose the gradient tool and we're going to start on this side because the top color is the color that is uh, activated when you first click in a gradient pull across this way now we'll go back to the marching ants mode so that we can operate on our critter we're again seeing a strange uh, selection that does not look like a gradient, but it really is. Watch when we put brightness and contrast on how the left side gets darker than the right side does. I'm going to do this several times because we want this to look really Baroque, really nice and dark on the left and still it's not quite as dark as I'd like it to be, so I'm going to do it one more time. And maybe about there. That looks pretty good to me. I'm going to OK that, 
Command D to get rid of the marching ants. Check it out by looking at the clock underneath or the cupboard or whatever it is and see if you're happy with your selection. And it looks pretty good to me. Okay, I'm going to get rid of the visibility on the dog for just a moment and see if there's anything that can be done about this little patch here. I don't like it. I wouldn't mind it if it were here. I could always copy it. Let's see, this layer is probably auto-selected. Yeah, let's, uh, let's deselect that. And we're just, we just want this part of that layer. I'm going to copy it and paste it over here. Move it with the uh, Move tool. And it's got its transform control shown. I'm just going to uh, transform it until it works for that painting that I wanted in the background. But it's still here, and I don't like it here. If I were to just delete it, of course, I would see through to the geographer and the bookcase, which I don't want to do. So instead, I'm going to use a tool called the patch tool. And if you don't see it there, um, look underneath uh, the edit toolbar button, the three little dots. And you'll find it down here, along with a whole bunch, bunch of other tools, which uh, some of which I use pretty frequently. The patch tool I use a lot. The patch tool allows you to drag a selection marque around something, kind of like the, um, the lasso tool did. But this one, if you then move that, oh, whoops, I wasn't in the correct layer, the layer where the bookshelf actually is. If you then move that in a direction that you like better, it will slide that thing up. And um, often you can get very, very convincing uh, patchwork done. I'm going to Command D to deselect it. A little bit of a, of a value problem here because it was grabbing this area here. In fact, you can see this handle has been duplicated, right? It can only patch with something that it can actually find in your image, but if it can find something convincing, it will make a convincing patch. I'm going to do it one more time and see if I can get rid of that black thing, although that black thing is something I could easily simply ignore. And let's slide down this way, about like that, and voila, the black thing is gone. So the patch tool, you can see a little bit of a ghost image here, but it's a very handy way to get rid of things. So if you've done a lovely portrait of your grandmother and you wish that um, you had uh, taken out the beer bottle and the cheese sandwich on the table in front of her, this might be a good way to do that. It will, uh, it will work magic with your photographs. Let's put everything back in and see where we are. We've now got a refrigerator. We've got a uh, dark painting or something against a fairly light wall that turns dark as it moves over. We've got a brightly lit substitute for the geographer, light falling from the left, nice chiaroscuro, a dark chair, which I suspect we should darken a little bit more. We need some kind of piece of furniture or a hippopotamus or something in here to substitute for this piece of furniture, desk or whatever, that has this big throw over it. Um, and we need some bright little critter here, perhaps, to substitute for the globe. Um, we can throw in something like a... Let's see what I've got here. Oh, a piano. Could I put a piano in there, perhaps? Let's go to that piano. Oh, this would be a piece of cake to select, right? Magic wand tool, correct? You knew that. <laughs> We're going to click on the white. Select the whole thing. We've got a few little things here. It probably doesn't matter because this is, I think, going to be down below the level of my um, file. But just for your knowledge, remember that if you want to add to your selection, make sure that the Add to Selection button is clicked here. And then you can simply click on these areas too. And of course, what I'm doing here is selecting the background. So now I have to go Select invert to actually select the piano itself. If I want to make sure I don't get a little white rim and I'm a real stickler, I might go to modify selection and contract it by one pixel just to make sure I don't get anything extra. Command C to copy the whole thing and then I'm going to go back to where is my file, Johannes Vermeer, 
and Command V to paste it in. And I've got a tiny little piano. Obviously going to want to edit that. This layer is activated, so you can easily find it when you first put it in. Layer 7, and it's in a pretty good place. It needs to be in front of the fridge and the curtain, and it is. It needs to be, uh, it can also be in front of the painting on the wall, but it does need to be behind the chair and the dog, so we're good. I'm going to um, put these layers back in so that we can kind of see what we're doing a little bit more here. And now I'm going to use the Move tool, make sure the layer is auto-selected, um, move my piano where I want it, probably need to reverse that thing so that it has pre presents a more interesting uh, face to the dog here. I can just flip it like that. I'm going to move it back into the file. Going to uh, scale it, right? It needs to be a lot bigger. This dog is thinking about learning to play the piano. And again, this piece of, I'm going to uh, accept my, select, my uh, transformation here, this piece of furniture, let's get the stuff out of the way so that we can see it. Um, this piano that we're putting in really just needs to be very dark down here and move slowly into a little bit more detail and be bright on top. If it isn't bright on top, we might find something bright to put on the top of it. So let's put this uh, stuff back in. And what do you know? It is dark down here. We're going to make it darker, and it is pretty bright on top. And there's a little bit of interest kind of in the middle, probably enough that we can get away with. If the piano doesn't completely cover up the stuff down here, we're going to have to find something to put under there, maybe even just a rectangle of black. And I can show you how to do that, too. But let's go right now to Image Adjustments. Whoops. Image Adjustments. Brightness contrast. We're going to turn the brightness way down on this piano so that it matches what we've got down here a little bit better. And we can turn the contrast up a bit if we'd like to see that um, the top of the piano a little bit more bright, like turn the brightness up a little bit because I'm not happy with how bright the top of the piano is. There we go. Still add a little bit more contrast. All right, now we've given our dog something to think about and look at. I'm going to move that piano around. I'm going to OK this. I'm going to move that piano around a bit. Um, maybe something a little bit more like that. And again, it is a problem that this area of darkness here was painted by, by Vermeer rather than me. And one very, very simple thing that I could do there is to click on the background layer and use the rectangle tool. We have the same shape tools here that you will find in Illustrator, and they're used in exactly the same way, well, almost exactly. I'll make a big black rectangle here. I will give it a fill. I can give it a black fill, or I can give it a dark gray fill, and it went in right above my background and underneath the other layers, so I'm happy. That covers up uh, Vermeer, and gives my piano a nice uh, uh, background there. Okay, now I'm beginning to get a collage that might approximate what we've got going in Vermeer here. Obviously, I'm still going to need, oh, probably something. If I, if I click the visibility off on all these things, you'll see that there's, there are some things that I haven't paid much attention to yet. For example, this bright globe is a very important thing, and the bright window on the side here. I, let's put something in, in in place of that bright globe. I think that um, we don't need to finish this for you folks to get the idea of how to do it. But let's uh, this will this will give us an interesting selection technique here. I've got a bunny that I think is very very bright and may work well for that area. I'm going to get rid of this window here just to give us a little bit more room. So what kind of selection technique might we use to select the bunny and the, uh, not the green grass? We could try selecting the green stuff. Uh, we could use the um, probably the magic wand tool would work in the add to selection mode. First get the darkest greens, then get the middle greens. Whoops, we got a little bit of stuff we don't want there. We could try turning down the, the tolerance. I'm going to Command-Z that to, say, 20. 
so that it won't tolerate these browns. Let's see if that works. That did seem to work, although it missed a lot of stuff up here. Click it again. You can see we're picking up a little bit of stuff in here that we, that we didn't want to select. But let's keep going for now. I've got the tolerance turned way down and to 20. So I'm getting, adding to the selection, I'm, uh, I'm not getting as much as I would like right off the bat. I'm having to do a little bit more clicking to clean up some of these areas. Um, and, I, and you can see that there's some things around the whiskers here that didn't get quite selected. I, I should mention, of course, that what I'm doing here again is selecting the background rather than the bunny itself, because the bunny's more complicated, right? And I've got something that kind of approximates the selection I want. Let's invert it so that we can see what we've really got. Oh yeah, so I've got my bunny selected, but I've still got a few things out here selected that I don't want. This is a great time to use the quick mask mode for cleanup. If you look at your selection in terms of this red mask, you can really easily see what you've got and what you haven't got. Now my bunny kind of peters out into the grass and I can tolerate that because I'm going to be putting him uh, behind a piano, I think. So I think we're probably okay with that. But I do want to get rid of, I don't want to bring all this grass in. And I do want to bring the whole bunny in here. You see uh, part of it is still under a mask. So I'm going to use the paintbrush tool to actually paint on more of the, uh, the orange mask where I'd like to, I'm just going to paint it on here like this. See, see how I'm making this green disappear under the mask? Just scrubbing it on real quick. And when I get up to my bunny, I might be a little bit more careful. Maybe I'll break my paint job up into some separate uh, strokes here so that if I do anything wrong, I can Command Z and go backwards. I'm going to get rid of this stuff here. Now I've gotten rid of the stuff in the background. Maybe, maybe I'll get rid of the stuff around the whiskers here that I really don't want to select. I mean, not that I really do want a mask, yeah. And then there's some area here that's orange in the bunny itself. And to either get rid of that, I can paint with white, or I can use the eraser. I think I'll do that because I think that's a little bit more intuitive. My eraser tool is rather small, and I'm going to enlarge it just a bit so that we can see it a little bit better. And I'm simply going to scrub away some of the mask itself. Remember that with Quick Mask, the stuff that's orange is protected from selection. The stuff that's clear is selected. And you can see that there's a little area here that isn't orange. It's very, very hard to see these tiny little areas when you're in Quick Mask mode. But what you can do, of course, is get out of Quick Mask into Marching Ants. And then any little bright sparkles of Marching Ants like that will show you that you've got some areas that you've missed. This is not something that would cause a problem in my target file. But to get rid of it, I could easily do something like put a selection marque around it in the subtract from selection mode and get rid of those little shiny pixels that I don't want. Here's another one, here's another one. Okay, so there's my bunny. Command C to copy. Go back to my target file, Johannes Vermeer, Command V to paste. And where did that bunny go? Oh, he went down behind the curtain. Let's raise him up, at least above the piano, right? Okay, there's the bunny. Now we're going to grab the move tool. Going to move that bunny over so that he's about where the, um, the globe would be and I will put him behind the piano since he doesn't have any legs, poor thing, so that it looks as if he's sitting on some other piece of furniture. Although ideally, I suppose I would find a bunny with legs and put him on the piano, perhaps. Now I'm going to adjust his brightness. I want him to be just as bright as that beautiful bright globe, so I'm going to Whoops, raise his brightness up and also juice up his contrast so that he's got a lot of Baroque shadows to melt into the negative shapes. Click OK. 
and we've got our bunny. I hope that gives you some idea of the kind of transformations that you can make here, the kind of images that you can find and put together. So although this collage isn't finished, we still have a um, beautifully painted window from Vermeer showing through all my uh, found imagery that I've cut and pasted over it. I would have to find something bright with some possibly some high contrast elements to it to put in there to really finish this. Something that looked like a light source, of course, would be nice. But I think this is enough to give you the idea of how you can use selection techniques to uh, cut images out of found photographs and how you can edit them and transform them in order to make them fit in your collage, even adjusting their brightness, their contrast, their orientation, and their size. So the, uh, as far as the images themselves go, I obviously took a very surreal approach to this collage because I was more interested in showing you Photoshop techniques than in um, picking, uh, uh, say, an autobiographical theme or a humorous theme or something like that. But um, in the magazine collage that I did, you may have noticed that I tried to use a sort of a musical theme. And although the music theme is one that's very close to my heart and one that I enjoyed working on, it did add to the difficulty of finding images, especially because I was also looking for images of a certain size and a certain uh, value range. Um, in the Photoshop collage, you won't have quite so much trouble, but uh, the picky you are, pickier you are about your images, obviously, the more time you're going to find yourself putting into this and probably the better piece you'll come up with. Good luck, have fun, and I'm uh, really looking forward to seeing what you'll come up with and how you'll use Photoshop or even a scissors and glue to create an interesting and expressive collage using a Baroque value structure.